Welcome to another video. So, as you can see, I'm at the pool. And I'm gonna talk about the only video you need to watch in order to learn how to swim. Okay, so I've made hundreds of YouTube tutorials on how to swim. And you can check them out on YouTube if you want. And I thought I'd make a, an updated version for 2024. All right, so if you haven't watched my previous videos, go watch them now if you want. In this video, I'm gonna give you everything I know about swimming and what you need to learn and what you need to know. Okay, so first of all, what you see right now on your screen is where you should not be at all. This is the worst time and this is the worst place to learn how to swim if you are a beginner. And let me tell you why. The worst time to train at the gym, if you know your thing, is January. Why? Because all those New Year's resolutionists flock the gym. We call those people tourists. What you see right now is peak tourist season when it comes to swimming. Everyone is thinking about swimming when the weather is hot and when summer is here. This is the worst time to learn swimming. As you can see, the pool is crowded with tourists. Families, people who don't know how to swim, are just trying to have fun. That's fine. But I'm just warning you, if you're trying to learn how to swim, summer is not the time to swim. The best time to swim is the complete opposite. It's the winter time. That's when this pool is dead. Nobody's thinking about swimming when there's snow coming out of your window. Everyone's thinking about skiing or snowboarding. And that's the perfect time to learn to swim because you get space. Look at how crowded it is right now. What you're seeing right now is real time action. Lots of people who don't know how to swim, they're just having fun cooling off, that's fine. But this is what you're going to be dealing with if you're trying to learn how to swim. Too much people, too much traffic. The worst time to learn how to drive is during rush hour. You know it for a fact. You would never teach someone to learn how to drive when it comes to rush hour time, never. So, if you want to learn how to swim, you should learn in the winter. That's when your pools are dead quiet. Second thing, the place. This is not the place to learn how to swim. This is a public pool, your local community center. Look around you, what do you see? You see so many stimulants. Music, kids screaming. This is large areas like pool, you got a kiddie pool, you got a shallow pool, deep pool, you got, you got different team swim clubs, all lifeguards, all types of swimming levels competing for your attention and for the space in the water. This is the worst place to learn how to swim because of the foot traffic. Where you want to swim is somewhere peaceful where you don't have to worry or be stressed out. And that place, in my opinion, is a condo pool. Why a condo pool? Because there's less foot traffic. A condo pool is only occupied by condo residents. It's very, very, very little foot traffic when it comes to condo pools. Hotel pools? are okay, but you're dealing with a lot of traffic as well. Foot traffic, tourists come and go. All right, a lot of people, they're on vacation. Airbnb is the same thing. They don't really have their thinking caps on when it comes to swimming, when they're in tourist mode. So keep that in mind. If you really want to learn to swim, the best time to do it is in the winter time. And the best place to practice is in a condo pool. So you have to find a condo pool, get access to one, and you will not have to deal with the general public. A condo pool is like learning how to drive in an empty, vacant parking lot. That's the best place to learn how to drive because you don't have to worry about crashing into things. Look at how many people there are right now. Do you think you can handle all of these people while at the same time you're learning how to learn how to swim? So keep that in mind. Now, how long does it take to learn how to swim? This question I get asked every day 
How many lessons do I need? How many lessons do you need to learn how to drive? Let me ask you that. How many lessons do you need in order to learn piano? Let me ask you that. Quite a few. Maybe about eight to 12 lessons, private lessons, one hour each, in order to get a grasp of the basics. But the more important question is how many hours do you need to invest in order to get good at swimming, in order to become a competent swimmer? You already know the answer. If you know how to drive, you know that you put thousands of hours into learning how to, how to drive. You know that if you, you learn a second language, a skill, it takes thousands of hours. So outside of whatever lesson you get, whether it's like a group lesson or a private instruction, you have to do the homework. You have to put thousands of hours into practicing, practicing, because, because your body is not going to get it overnight. It takes a long time to unlearn certain movements, especially when you're scared of the water. It takes a lot of time to unlearn how to properly breathe and put your mouth and nose in the water and blow your bubbles. Another question I get asked all the time, how should you use, Justin, your nose or your mouth? in order to breathe when you're swimming. You use both. You use both. But what happens is beginner swimmers use both or try to use both and what they do is they inhale water up their nose or up their mouth because they're trying to do two things at once. So the simple rule is if you're a beginner, learn how to breathe, blow bubbles, and inhale air through your mouth first. Now, do you need a nose clip or a snorkel to block your nasal passage? Yeah, you can. But you're setting yourself up for failure because using a snorkel, using a nose plug, using earplugs is like wearing training wheels on your bike forever. You eventually have to let them go. You have to let the training wheels come off eventually. So that means incorporating your nose into your bubbles. Incorporating your ears as you swim. Water's gonna get in your ears no matter what. Are you gonna get that water effect sloshing your ears, clogging up your ear canal after you swim? Yes, I get it all the time. Is there anything you can do about it? You can wear earplugs, you can wear ear, ear, earphones, but eventually you're gonna get water seeping in. And you just get used to it and you just gradually it, it empties out a few hours after your swim session. So get used to it. Do you drink water by accident or snort water up your nose by accident? Even if you're an experienced swimmer? Yes, it happens sometimes. Sometimes you're dealing with chops. Chops are when you're dealing with waves in the water created by other swimmers or someone like does a belly flop or a belly splash like you see right there. They're creating waves and then all of a sudden you come up for air and then that, that, that wave, that chop, enters your breathing canal, your nose, as you inhale. It happens, all right? So don't fall back on nose clips or earplugs or snorkel masks. If you're a tourist, fine, depend on them. But if you're aiming to become a competent swimmer and a very good experienced swimmer, even a lifeguard, then you need to learn how to use your nose and your mouth and your ears as you swim. You gotta get used to that feeling. I don't mind it at all. Water in my ear, I'm used to it. You can wear ear waterproof earphones and you can listen to music underwater. That's fine too if you want. What I'm telling you is there's no, wait, there's no avoiding it. Eventually you're going to have to use your nose. You're gonna have to use your ears and your mouth all at the same time. So just get used to it, just toughen up. Now, let's talk about gear. What should you bring or what should you purchase? What should you invest in, Justin? I get asked this a lot. If you're a guy, get jammers. Jammers, okay? Jammers are just like those shorts you see MMA fighters wear, okay? They're tight on your legs 
and they act like shorts. But the thing is, they help you hydrodynamic, hydrodynamically swim through the water, okay? Because if you have like baggy board shorts, baggy shorts, it's gonna act like a parachute, like a jelly. You just imagine a jellyfish in the water, right? You're not gonna be able to swim further or faster or when, you, when you're wearing board shorts or baggy shorts, swim shorts. You can, you can wear that if you're on vacation or you're just having fun, that's fine. But I'm telling you, if you want to swim thousands of laps and you want to get rid of all, as much resistance as possible, wear jammies. A lot of you guys, competitive swimmers, are saying, oh, just, why don't you just wear briefs? And I will tell you why. Briefs are too revealing. I don't want to wear a G-string to the pool and I, want, I don't want people looking at me with my G-string out. Yes, if you're a competitive swimmer, if you're a young boy, you're probably used to wearing briefs in your swim club. That's fine, go ahead. But don't encourage others if they're uncomfortable wearing that kind of revealing clothing. And I don't want to reveal my body like that. A lot of people aren't comfortable revealing their body wearing that kind of revealing clothing as briefs for guys. I'm just telling you my thoughts. Me, personally, I wear boxer briefs underneath my pants. Right? I don't wear briefs. I've never worn briefs. So that just tells you some people, some men have different preferences. So if you want to swim lots of laps, eliminate as much resistance, get jammers. Okay? If you want to have fun, just wear regular baggy shorts then. Women, you wear a one-piece swimsuit. Don't wear a bikini. It's too revealing, it's gonna fall off. It's gonna, you're gonna have so many complications. If you're on vacation, if you're just suntanning, if you're just bathing, yeah, fine, wear a bikini. But if you're gonna swim laps, you're gonna take this seriously, wear a one-piece swimsuit, okay? You see it from competitive swimmers, female competitive swimmers, just, just get one. In fact, you should be getting several. How many, how many runners do you have? Or sorry, how many pairs of socks do you have? That's a good question. So if you're going to be swimming seriously, you're going to be swimming at least one to three times a week. So in that case, you're going to need one to three pairs of shorts, one to three pairs of jammers, one to three pairs of goggles, one to, th one to three swim caps, etc., etc. So prepare long term if you're going to swim seriously. I've had students, they show up for class and their parents only bought them one pair of goggles. And guess what? That pair of goggles snapped during the lesson. They broke. And so what do we do? We can't swim anymore because the kid can't see where he's going. So me, I have eight to 10 pairs of goggles in my bag, ready to go. I have lots of swim caps ready to go in case one breaks. So keep that in mind. You're gonna get, have to invest in three to five pairs of each item if you're gonna swim regularly because things break. You have to wash them sometimes or they're, they're not available. Things happen, okay? Just like gym clothes. You don't just buy one t-shirt, one pants. You, if you're going to the gym seriously, you're going to go three, five times a week. So you need to invest in several. So that brings me to goggles. You need three to five pairs of goggles. One for the daytime, one for the nighttime, one neutral. Okay. There's amber for evening. If, if the lighting of your pool is too dark, which happens, I've swam in parks. I'm oh, sorry, pools that are outdoors. It's evening time, there's no lights out, so you're gonna to need to invest in amber goggles. Right? They're, they're like evening sunglasses for driving. They're like night, night glasses for driving, right? And I've swam in like really bright conditions, like really the sun's gleaming over my head, so you're gonna need shade, shaded goggles, okay? Tinted goggles. So you need goggles for every occasion, and you need backup pairs in case one breaks. Straps break all the time. It's inevitable, okay? No pair lasts forever. So, if you want to know what brands I recommend, get Speedo or Tear. Those are popular. They're like the Nike and Adidas or something. 
next, swim caps. What kind of swim caps should you get? Here's the short answer, get silicone. Silicone is strong, durable, very flexible, very hard to break, but the downside is they are heavy. Look in your kitchen, look at your pair of silicone gloves, and look at your pair of latex gloves. Usually if you're dishwashing, if you're washing dishes, you're wearing latex gloves because they're light, you can put them on easily, they're not heavy, and yeah, you, you can touch the dishes. Feels like you're touching the, the dishes, right? Nice and thin. Same goes with the latex swim caps. Some people opt for latex swim caps because they're thinner, they're lighter, and they help you swim faster. So you don't, it feels like you're wearing nothing on your head. The problem with latex though, same with latex dishwashing gloves, is that they break easily. They will rip. And you'll need to invest in another pair, another cap, and another cap. So I've broken so many latex swim caps that I got fed up over time. So what I did was, I just used silicone swim caps, okay? You can stretch them to your heart's content. And women, you can cover your long hair using a silicone swim cap versus latex. Latex will rip instantly, so. If you have long hair, women, you wanna bundle it up, use a silicone swim cap. Now, what is the purpose of a silicone, or what is the purpose of a swim cap in general? You're probably thinking it's to keep your hair dry, duh. But that's not the answer. When, no matter what type of swim cap you wear, latex, silicone, you're gonna get your hair wet, you're gonna get your sideburns wet, you're gonna get the back of your hair wet eventually. Water's gonna seep in. No swim cap is waterproof, 100%. If you want a 100% waterproof experience keeping your hair dry, then you invest in like a scuba helmet. It's like those deep sea divers wear. You're never gonna get your hair completely dry. So what is the purpose of a swim cap? The purpose of a swim cap is keep your hair tidy and out of the way and make your head more hydrodynamic. Think of a nose of an airplane. The nose of an airplane is bald, all right? It lets the air flow, cuts through the air. Same with a swim cap. The swim cap allows your head to be hydrodynamic, cuts through the water easily. If your hair is jostling all over the water, you're gonna have a hard time seeing. It's just like hair in the way when you're trying to run. That's why you wear a cap or a hat in order to keep your hair out of your eyesight, out of the way, from dangling all over the place. So the swim cap is to, to allow your, your hair to be more hydrodynamic, cut through the water faster, and to keep your hair tidy. Now, women and men, if you have medium to long hair, yes, you need a swim cap. What about guys with really short hair or no hair, like bald hair? If you're bald, then you don't really need a swim cap because you don't, it defeats the purpose, right? You, you have no hair and you don't need to keep it out of your, your vision. So, if you're bald, you don't need a swim cap. If you have like really short hair, guys, like what I'm talking like a buzz cut, you probably don't need a swim cap. But I swam with buzz cut hair and I actually prefer having a silicone swim cap on top because I just feel faster as I swim through the water. Because most of the time as you're swimming forwards, you're headbutting the water, the top of your head, right? So that top of your head has to be as hydrodynamic as possible, like a missile, or like the nose of an airplane, all right? So, get several swim caps, get various colors, okay? It just helps with your swimming. So you got your swim caps, you got your goggles, you got your jammers, you got your one-piece swimsuit, what else should you get, okay? Flip-flops. You have no idea how disgusting pools are. People are walking around with street shoes. There are people that are non-swimmers that are walking all along the deck, pool deck, with their street shoes and they're carrying all that dirt and filth. Or they're dragging all that filth from the shower room, the change room, onto the pool deck and into the water. So, invest in 
a good pair of flip-flops so you can shower in them and you can walk along the pool deck without slipping and you don't have to step on something like for example broken glass or any sharp objects or bugs or rocks or pebbles which I have stepped on barefoot in the shower in the change room on the pool deck it happens okay every pool is different some pools are maintained better than others but eventually you're gonna get debris whatever you step on so get in a good pair of flip-flops and when you enter the change room you switch your shoes for your flip-flops you walk around you get changed you take a shower on your flip-flops with your flip-flops and then you walk onto the pool deck and then you take your flip-flops off and then you slowly enter the water all right so let's keep on to this topic about how pools are very how pools are very dirty pools are like toilets in my opinion they are the filthiest things you can ever encounter if the conditions are wrong all right and again it has to do with foot traffic the more foot traffic a pool has the more unhygienic how more dirty it, it, it gets it's just common sense so a pool like this is highly chlorinated which is another reason why you shouldn't swim in a place like this the chlorine levels of this type of pool are, are, are at its limit when, because there's so many people swimming in here in and out hundreds of people in and out of this pool daily so the chlorine levels have to be higher in order to kill all of that bacteria that you see or you don't see so as a result lifeguards and swim instructors or people like myself that swim regularly in these types of pools get skin problems okay too much chlorine exposure can really affect your skin can affect your sinuses just can affect your your head over time you get I call it chlorine sickness right just like radiation sickness now you're exposing yourself to chlorine high amounts high levels of chlorine for several hours eventually you're gonna get sick you're gonna get hurt your skin's gonna burn and I don't care how thorough you are in rinsing your body off with soap and water I have to do it multiple times sometimes because the chlorine it just dries and it sticks to your skin like I don't know like a parasite so sometimes I have to take two or three showers afterwards in order to scrub off all of that chlorine out of my system sometimes all right so if you compare a pool like this to like your average condo pool the chlorine levels in the condo pool are very low because there's obviously not as much foot traffic so keep that in mind so what makes the chlorine levels of a pool like this so high well, it's not just foot traffic it's people's hygiene a lot of these people don't shower before entering the pool and this is something a pet peeve of mine that pisses me off a lot a lot of these tourists don't really know how unhygienic it is to swim into the or into the water without sh showering thoroughly before entering it think about your body your body before it enters the water you got hair product you got gel you got hairspray you got wax in your hair you got dirt or dust in your hair you got makeup on your face if you're a woman eyeliner lipstick foundation all that stuff you've got suntan lotion sunscreen on your body applied on your body maybe because the weather's hot you've got sweat you've got foot uh, toe jam you've got I, I, I hate to say it you got poop crust in your asshole you got piss hanging off your genital you got sweat you got cologne you got perfume you got deodorant all these chemicals make up a perfect chemical storm 
So, if you don't believe me, go to an ocean on Sunday. You can see, like, I've seen it firsthand. When I swam at a beach, that was crowded. You can see the chemical film that's developing on top of the surface of the ocean water. From all the sunscreen, all the lotion, all the everything that's just not rinsed off before people enter the, the ocean. It's just as bad as a pool like this. People don't rinse, thoroughly rinse. So, if you're a parent, if you're, if you're doing swimming lessons, if you're going to swim, seriously, rinse off your entire body from head to toe in the shower before you enter the water, okay? It'll do yourself a favor, it'll do your neighbor a favor, it'll do the, the chlorine system of a, this type of pool a favor. Again, the people don't care, they just, they go at it and then they complain why they get sick afterward. I get sick a, a lot in a pool like this because somebody, most people, they didn't shower thoroughly, they didn't rinse thoroughly, so I get sick, I get affected because that water, that film on the surface of the water enters my mouth, whether you like it or not. You will never get the water 100% out of your mouth when you swim. When you're blowing bubbles, your mouth, your tongue, your ears, everything is in contact with the water. There's no way, unless you're wearing a giant scuba diving suit, okay? You can't avoid it. So you will have contact with the water with your mouth. So that's why it's so important to rinse off as much as you can thoroughly before entering the water. I've had parents, I've had full-grown adults get insulted at me when I say, please shower before entering the pool. And these people have their hair done and their makeup on still. You name it. So, Lifeguards, us lifeguards, us swim instructors, we have to bear the brunt of this burden. We get sick a lot. Nobody benefits. So please, please shower thoroughly before entering the water. Okay, now, let's talk about lessons. Where should you learn to swim? Who should you learn it from? Should you take public lessons at your local swimming pool? My suggestion is for you to try once. Sign up for a semester of swimming lessons at your local pool. See whether you like it or not. Most people don't. Because the lessons are overcrowded, there's too many students versus the instructor. The instructor is not qualified enough. The instructor is usually a teenager, green, fresh off certification. So you won't really get, you get what you pay for. Swimming lessons at a pool like this are cheap, but you get what you pay for. You won't learn much. And their goal as a business is to keep you hooked on these lessons. A pool like this costs thousands of dollars to, to run and operate. So they need recurring revenue. So how do they get that recurring revenue every month? By failing students, by keeping students hooked on these lessons. There are like 12 and beyond levels when it comes to swim lessons. Do you need that many levels? Maybe. Maybe not. What if I told you you just need to learn two strokes? And then you're pretty much competent when it comes to swimming. Do you need to be competent or competitive? Ask yourself that. Most people want to be competent drivers. Very few want to be competitive drivers. So you have to decide what it is that you want. So, a pool like this costs thousands of dollars to operate, right? You gotta heat this pool, you gotta pay the staff, let their staff, keep the rent, keep, keep the money flowing, right? Keep the lights on. So they do it by keeping students, gullible students like you, hooked on their lessons. They want you to keep enrolling. They want you to keep coming to the lessons. So, people ask me how many lessons does it take to learn to swim? If you enroll in public swimming lessons, it may take you five, maybe, maybe seven years. Because that's how long they want to keep you hooked. Right? Five to seven years worth of lessons, that's enough money to keep this, the lights on. Now, if you sign up for private lessons, 
from a coach like myself, then it's not going to take you years. It's probably going to take you a few months at most. Plus, you incorporate the thousands of hours of homework that you have to put in on your own time, then you don't need to take five or seven years to learn how to swim. So, this may be shocking for most of you, not surprising for some of you. Keep that in mind. Every time you enroll your, your child or yourself in swimming lessons in a pool like this, their goal is to keep you hooked. They want you to keep coming back here. If I had to teach a student, at most, three months worth of lessons, and they're pretty much competent as a swimmer. If they want to go beyond three months, then they go into competitive mode. So keep that, in, think about that. So how much do you pay for private lessons? It depends on the level of the swim instructor. It depends on you know, what their business is like. That can range from 40 to like 120 bucks an hour. Yeah, it's just like personal training. It depends on the trainer. So, a lot of you are thinking, oh, that's a lot of money. To me, it's not. Because, again, look, think about it. Do you want to learn to swim in months? Or do you want to learn to swim in years? If you want to learn to swim in five, seven years, then keep going to public swimming lessons like this. You get your money's worth. That's, you get what you pay for. All right? Low quality lessons, overcrowded, mostly young, instructors because again if you're in charge of a pool like this you want to hire a McDonald's staff you want young staff that are vulnerable gullible manipulable yada yada right so if you're an expert sim coach like myself you're going to charge a higher higher price okay quality over quantity so a lot of students, a lot of parents come to me after they've gone through the public swimming lessons system because, again, they're frustrated. Their, their child keeps failing. They keep enrolling in the same lessons. And it becomes more of like a social, social event, right? They just want to, the kids just want to have fun. They want to hang out with their friends. And they're not really learning much. They're just, you're just paying for babysitting less, babysitting in the water most likely. If you want your child to learn how to swim, become confident, send them to a swim coach. Private lessons is the way. Okay? That's what I would do. But again, first go through the public swimming system and then if you're dissatisfied, then switch to a private coach. If you want to learn how to swim with me, you can contact me down below. Other questions? Can I learn to swim when I'm pregnant? Yes, but you can't really move much, okay? Being in the water, in the shallow water, and just moving around or walking around is good enough. You don't need to do strenuous exercise if you're pregnant. Uh, will swimming be bad for my skin and hair? Yes. You're exposing, you're slowly exposing yourself, your body, your skin, your hair to chemicals chemicals like chlorine. Over time, that chlorine will make your, your skin, your body hurt, okay? It'll, it'll affect your hair. If you have colored hair or permed hair, it will damage it easily. Keep that in mind. If you have sensitive skin, sensitive hair, you want to limit your exposure to public pools. And again, like I said, try for condo pools. Uh, other things that I can think of off the top of my head. Thinking. Hmm. Oh, will swimming help me lose weight? It's a trick question. Will working out help me lose weight? Yes, it will. But there's, there are other factors, two other factors. Nutrition and recovery. 
lot of swimmers, a lot of competitive swimmers, they eat a lot of, ton of carbs. Because swimming makes you really hungry. You, it's like having a slow seizure for hours, okay? You're gonna burn a lot of calories. And as a result, you get really hungry and you wanna refill those calories up. So you eat a lot of pasta, junk food, and all that. When you're young, it's okay. But when you're older, not so good. So that's why you see like, That announcement guy is telling kids to walk to the slide. Because a lot of people run and then they slip and they hit their head on concrete. Unfortunately, I've seen that happen. I've almost slipped several times on the on the pool deck because the water the, the pool deck's so slippery, right? It's con it's tiles with water. So walk very slowly and wear flip-flops if you can. Okay, so. What was I saying? It's bad for your skin, yeah. Okay, on the pole, yeah. Okay, now, you got your gear, you got your on the pole, you got, you got the right mindset, you're, you're, high, you're thoroughly rinsing yourself off and putting into the pool. Now what? What should you learn? You need only two strokes. Breaststroke and front crawl. Or they call it freestyle. I call it front crawl. Here in Canada, we call it front crawl. You only need two strokes, breaststroke and front crawl. Why? Because most swimmers use front crawl and breaststroke. Breast, back crawl, butterfly, you can learn that later on. If you're a competitive swimmer, yeah, you can learn that. But why complicate things by trying to learn four languages when it's better to focus on two in the beginning? So. Most of the time, 99% of the time, I'm swimming front crawl or breaststroke when I'm doing laps. And so should you. So focus on the front crawl, front crawl and breaststroke. Front crawl and breaststroke are like the yin and yang. They both complement each other. Front crawl is like running. Breaststroke is like jogging, right? One's a slow version, one's a faster version, okay? One, you can, Relax, the other, you can push yourself. You can push yourself in both, actually. You can like do a really aggressive breaststroke, or you can do a really relaxing breaststroke, like you see a lot of seniors do. So breaststroke is really easy on the joints, and easier to pull off when you're a senior and when you get older. Front goal is a little bit harder and more strenuous on the body. When you're young, yeah, but when you get older, you want something like breaststroke in your arsenal. So, my recommendation is to learn both, front crawl and breaststroke, so you can play around with both versions. You can switch. You've got two gears in your car to play with, a slow speed and a fast speed, okay? You can do a relaxing front crawl. You can do a really aggressive front crawl. But it's good to switch back and forth between front crawl and breaststroke. So learn those two strokes. Do you need to learn how to dive? No, not in the beginning. Diving is for competitive swimmers. You dive off competitive blocks. No pool in the right mind will allow you to dive off the ledge, even at public swim, because that's when most tourists smash their spine, their head into the floor on the bottom of the pool because they don't know how to dive competently. So, first thing on your checklist is to learn front crawl and to learn breaststroke, okay? Learn those two first. Learn how to push off the wall and do a front glide, okay? Front glide is what starts your breaststroke or front crawl as you swim laps, okay? You're pushing off that wall, okay? It gives you that momentum, right? That oomph in the beginning. So learn the front, front glide, you're pushing up the wall, okay? And you don't need to do a flip turn, you don't need to learn flip turn, you don't need to dive in order to pull that off, okay? It's just a simple push off the wall. Later on, 
once you're good at front call, once you're good at front breaststroke, then you can incorporate other strokes like breast, uh, backstroke, butterfly. Then you can learn how to dive. Then you can learn how to foot turn. Then you can learn how to tread water. Now, treading water, do you need to learn that in the beginning? No. Here's why. You can practice front crawl and breaststroke laps in the shallow end of the pool. You don't need to venture out into the deep end if you don't want to, okay? You can see sections of a pool right now. There's a shallow section, there's a medium section, and then there's a deep section. You can stay in this shallow section forever and swim laps back and forth. Most kind of pools don't have a deep section, really. Like the, the deep section of a condo pool will go up to your chest level high when you're standing upright. So that's another advantage of swimming in condo pools. You don't have to worry about drowning or learning how to do treading water. Treading water, is it important? Yes. If you're swimming in the ocean, if you're swimming in, a, in the deep end of a pool, obviously, yeah, you're gonna learn that. But should you learn that? No. Again, don't complicate things. Keep things simple at first. Focus on two things, breaststroke and front pole. Spend the next two to three months of your journey, the first two to three months, just learning front crawl and breaststroke, and learning how to front glide, pushing up the wall. That's all you should learn, those three things. Then month four, month five, maybe year two, then you can learn, start learning flip turn dives, treading water. You see, it's a natural progression. Because if you try to learn so many things at once, which is what public swimming lessons try to do, they try to overload you because they want to confuse you, they want to make you feel incompetent, and they want you to come back again and again and keep learning because that's a slow way of learning how to swim. Okay, by learning, trying to learn so many things at once, okay, it's overstimulation, too much for your brain to handle, especially if you're a kid. So. You now have a plan. You know when to swim in winter time, where to swim on a pole, what gear to get, goggles, swim cap, jammers, one piece swimsuit, flip flops, towel, you know, proper hygiene, thoroughly rinse yourself before entering the water. You know what to learn, you gotta learn front crawl and breast for the first two or three months. You have all you need right now to learn how to swim. That, those are the basics. So, if this is all too much for you, rewatch this video again and again. If you have questions or comments, leave them down below. You can ask me. If you want to sign up for lessons, go to my website, 7 day and yeah, that's all I know about swimming. Or, or all you need to know about swimming in 2024. So I hope this video has helped you. Thanks for watching. I wish you good luck on your journey when it comes to swimming. I'll talk to you later, okay? My name is Justin. See you later.